All right, it is 11 o'clock. We're starting 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, as you join or have friends that join, please make sure they mute their microphones. My name is Andy Starnes. I'm with Insight Training. I'll be facilitating the webinar for these wonderful people that have uh, blessed us with all their experience and subject matter expertise. Today, you're in for a treat. It's going to be 90 miles an hour in 90 minutes, but it will be recorded. Uh, please continue to mute your microphones as you join in. Otherwise, it will sound like an echo of 300 different hallways because we'll have 369 people supposedly joining. It will be recorded and posted on YouTube at a later date once we edit it and make it look pretty. I'm sure I'll have lots of help with that because it's not my forte. Uh, we will be talking about uh, basically decision-making drone use in webinar, th this webinar today. Specifically, everybody's using drones, but as you'll hear from a lot of smarter people than me, are they using them correctly? Are they trained correctly? Are they getting grounded before they even get off the ground by not uh, <laughs> learning the proper procedures, training, and certifications? So that's what we're going to hear about today from the emergency responder aspect. And don't worry if you want more of this, we're going to do part two, three, four, as much as we can do uh, to break down each, com each concept from firefighting, law enforcement, search and rescue, disaster, uh, new software applications and more because we've got some really amazing people here today. We want to thank uh, All Mobile Video, FLIR, Fox Fury, 910 Drones, uh, all of our sponsors, uh, some great supporters that are joining us today, which I'll introduce you here momentarily. And as you know, we are giving away, thanks to uh, All Mobile Video, we're giving away a DJI Mavic Mini. So uh, that will be announced at a later date because we won't have time to do it today once we get the actual list of participants. Uh, that will include a light from Fox Fury, if I'm correct on that. Antonio, you can correct me. Is that right? Yes, sir. What type of light is it again? It's gonna be a, one of our D3060 uh, small format lights. Sweet. So you're going to have a drone that can see really well, day or night. And we're also going to have a FLIR K1 situational awareness camera donated. And this will be recorded and posted on YouTube at a later date. Please do your microphones as you do on your own. Try to go back and mute as everybody's joining, but it is. Please mute your microphones, everyone. Anyone joining by phone, by the way, Zoom does not allow you to learn that the hard way. Not as user. Please mute your microphones, everyone. So we're going to continue onward and talk about how this can enhance your decision making today. Uh, Paul Rossi from 910 Drones is going to start off with the introduction on what we need to know to get started. Uh, myself and uh, hopefully my fellow cohort, Terrence Shumate, is going to talk about uh, firefighting applications and hazmat. Uh, law enforcement will be covered by several of our members today, uh, Jack White and Michael Leo, and I believe a couple other gentlemen who will introduce themselves. Rick Smith, I believe Michael Mott's you with us, I believe, too. Uh, several of us who have way more experience in the law enforcement world. And right now, I can tell you, I've always had my utmost respect for you guys, but props to you in this world right now. You've got my, my prayers and thought, <clears throat> anything. Anytime you want a cup of coffee and want to talk, I'm, I'm here for my law enforcement brothers and sisters. Uh, importance of, excuse me, drone use and disaster response and search and rescue, which is really prevalent. We have a wonderful guest, Mike Chapman from FLIR who is going to share his experiences, knowledge, and, and uh, basically some photos and videos of how that works. Uh, the lighting aspect, I'm gonna tell you from just a dumb fireman perspective that I've learned the hard way that if you can't see, you'll make a mistake. And it's not so much what's around you, but what you don't see. And Antonio and Rick will talk about the value of lighting from a drone perspective to on the ground. And then Paul's gonna close us out with out of the box, low cost solutions and prove to us that Hey, you don't have to have a million dollars or even a quarter of a million dollars to have a drone program. Uh, right now in this world with all the stuff going on, budgets are a big deal. They're always a big deal. They're especially a big deal right now. So let me uh, turn this over here to Paul. And Paul, I will manage the chat room if anyone has any questions. And I'm going to just handle muting all the ones that are not muting their microphones so it doesn't distract from you. Paul, are you with us? Yes, I am. 
All right, I'm going to take care of the muting stuff here, and you uh, let me know when you're ready, and I will move the presentation forward each time. All right, thank you very much, Andy, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon. I did want to mention that we do have Brandon Fitzhugh with us as well from the Spring Lake Fire Department, who's going to be able to uh, chime in, um, a local North Carolina operator. Um, of course. So the, uh, to, I have talked to uh, Moon Survey and Walden. Go ahead and mute my microphone. Awesome. Please yeah. mute your microphones, everybody. So uh, introduction and requirements for drone implementation. Uh, if you want to go ahead and kick to the next slide. I'd say just for everyone tuning in, I am Paul Rossi. I uh, own and operate 910 drones, helping public safety organizations leverage drones um, by helping them build plant, uh, build out programs, identify equipment, and then put those um, programs into play. So I did want to start out, we did have our uh, sponsor who was kind enough to help us get this uh, Mavic Mini that we're going to be giving away. And that is all mobile video. They provide the Insight RT1HC, which is a live streaming case. Uh, it streams securely through their data centers. Uh, any connection, whether it's Wi Fi, cellular, or Ethernet connection, you're going to be able to put any video in here. It's not limited to drones, but any HDMI output source, whether it's a ground cam or an aerial camera. So, again, big shout out to uh, all mobile video for, for coming in big with that Mavic Mini. So we can move on here. Next slide in. So when we're talking about integrating drones into daily operations, it's yes, you can just get the drone and start doing it, but how do we create a program that's going to be successful and it's gonna sustain itself? and it's going to show the benefits. And just anything else uh, we see in, in public safety, when you bring in something new, there's gonna be operations, there's going to be procedures, and everyone's going to need to be on the same page so that no matter who steps in to this position, whether it's day or night, uh, on the south side or the north side of the city or town, everybody's gonna be able to integrate and work together. So developing a flight operations manual and becoming familiar with what goes into a flight operations manual is one of those important things anyone looking to implement a program should be familiar with. You can go on these different sites. We've got on Facebook, public safety UAS groups, where people are all about sharing information, sharing operational manuals and procedures, and, and it's fabulous. The only thing is that these manuals that you're, this manual that you're implementing is the blood life of the program. So to just copy and paste and stick it in there just to say, hey, we're good to go, that's not the right solution. Seeing what other folks are doing and then utilizing that and building it and customizing it to what works for you is the right solution. So, yes, there's great resources, but find what's working and then customize that manual and operate for kind of what you're doing. The Next thing that folks are gonna, the, the biggest common question of public safety is part 107 or COA. So do I wanna fly under part 107 or am I gonna fly with a certificate of authorization from the FAA? To anyone that's beginning a program, no matter what you're gonna do, no matter what route you're gonna take, you have to have someone uh, at that department or, or organization that has their part 107 certificate. So if, if you're listening in and your department, your organization, your agency isn't leveraging drones at all, you're gonna identify, maybe you take it upon yourself to go ahead and acquire that part 107 certificate in order to begin flight operations and then the COA process because a 107 certified operator is going to have to take on that responsibility and get the ball rolling for that COA. 
training or goodness, you know what, go to the next slide. I think because you're right, you're wanting to click that and I'm just forgetting that I had these great, fabulous slides here, Andy. Um, hey, you contributed, I appreciate you. <laughs> so, so just going back, you can check, look at this slide. I talked about that flight operations manual. It's, it's the, the, the blood life of the program. So it doesn't matter who you're bringing in when you build that program up and you add new pilots, you're just adding another arm, another leg. So now you've got a body with two legs, two arms, and it doesn't matter who you're adding or subtracting. If they understand this operations manual, they're going to be able to step into your program and, and immediately add value. So that some of the things this operations manual is going to address is the protection of rights and privacy, which is a huge thing. But as, as law enforcement, as public safety, as fire departments, you're already leveraging cameras, right? Whether it's body cameras or truck cameras. So when it comes to protecting rights and privacies, the same way that you're protecting that imagery, you're gonna do the same thing with your drone imagery. Um, your, your manual is gonna lay out your administration, your safety, training, all these operating procedures. So you can go to the next slide. So part 107 or COA, as I mentioned, no matter which route you go, whether you're gonna do all part 107 and all your pilots are gonna have that part 107, or hey, we want to get this COA so that we can open up these other avenues, or we're going to have a COA and we're going to get our part pilots still have part 107. The difference between the two, I'm just going to go through quickly. So if you're wanting to take notes, the only, if you're operating civil operation, operations, that's part 107. To operate public, public operations can be done under the COA. So that's why public safety organizations, law enforcement, uh, fire, uh, police, they can operate under this COA. The responsibility, which is what the FAA is, is, is really concerned with, not necessarily liability, but the responsibility, operating under Part 107, the responsibility is going to come down to those individual pilots. When you're operating under a COA, if you're self-certifying, the responsibility is going to be held with that COA holder, the, the responsible individual or the organization. When you start talking about operations, you have, you cannot fly at night. You can't fly over people. These things are waverable under a part 107. If your organization gets a COA, some of these things are included in quotes. But what we've seen recently and what I've seen recently is that the waivers are not as difficult to obtain. So the same rules apply as far as operations under 400 feet and keeping that aircraft within visual line of sight. With all this being said, part 107 or COA, it's so dependent upon your organization, your department situation, where you might be operating, that if you have to jump into COA or part 107, it's not very clear. So connecting with a local drone service provider, connecting with other department and agencies in your area and finding out what they've done and what they haven't done, that is always a good place to start. Um, so you can slide. And with what I really would want to do kind of is bring in anyone on this panel at this time that has more experience, that has this experience operating under part 107 COA, if they have any points that they want to make specifically, um, whether it's uh, Michael, Rick, I know Jack's on here. Is there anything you guys would add Brother Chapman, do you like to add since you've traveled a lot too as well? No. No, uh, I would uh, this is Jack White. Um, I would I would say that we, we operate in a pretty congested airspace area. Um, under the COA, we we would have to if we weren't flying as a COA under COA, then we would waivers would be an issue for us, although we work real well with the FAA here. Uh, 
but it gives us the ability to fly pretty much anywhere in our region with that. We have, we don't have a jurisdictional call. We have a blanket COA, so we can pretty much fly anywhere in the state. Uh, okay. Uh, this is uh, Mike Motz with the Jericho County. Have a second, I can a couple things. We actually have a call jurisdictional and um, a blanket. Uh, but our air airspace here in Madeira is pretty wide open. Um, well, we got the uh, the blanket one uh, and the jurisdictional one, but the blanket one is for more of a mutual aid kind of thing. Okay. And I would say, yeah, we've seen uh, the 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 folks here with Michael, Jack. You guys are operating in that within that Class B airspace, and then Brandon fits you with the Spring Lake Fire Department operating in this DOD airspace. So there's definitely these situations where you have to have that, that COA because it's just, it's what the, maybe the, like the DOD wants to see the COA in order to allow that flight within their airspace, as opposed to, hey, we're gonna go after a waiver and have part 107. So I think it is uh, situationally dependent, but in order to get something started, Getting that 107, uh, which a lot of folks say, well, what training should I get? Should I take this online? Should I do this online? However, you can get that part 107, which fits in your schedule, and then reach out locally and find out who might be in your area that's either already doing it, has done it, um, or can help you do it. When it comes to, so the, 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 I think the big point with COA or 107, with the part 107, if you're operating under a 107, uh, for your program, you're taking that recertification test every 24 calendar months, and that's kind of the requirements. When you're operating under a COA, and you can self-certify your pilots where they don't have to be part 107, but you provide regular training, you're going to have to report, uh, you know, hours, operational, time in flight. There's, there's, um, uh, I don't, I don't want to make it sound extensive because it's not difficult and that's the biggest things you know when people say oh it's difficult well no it's just it's a requirement of a program and there's software out there whether it's a uh, you know integrated with drone sense or you know rocky mountain unmanned systems platform there's these companies that allow you to do your flights and track your hours and they're designed to create and publish reports for the faa so uh, next slide, Andy. Can I, just for a second? Go ahead, Rick. Rick, you're muted. Stand by, he, he got muted for some reason. Very good. Sorry, I'm on a computer out of the car. Uh, as it stands, we fly a lot in Solano County assisting Fairfield, and they have the Travis Air Base up there. So with the COA, we have kind of operated under that, along with our 107, that we're able to fly in a predetermined space in that military airspace on some of our incidents. And the same thing goes with the congested Bay Area. We go into Alameda County for mutual aid calls. So having both of those have actually played out, allowed us to have quick operations. And on top of that, we've coordinated with the different air units throughout our area to have a working relationship with CHP, Alameda County, Contra Costa County, so we can actually work dual with fixed and rotor aircraft while we have our UAVs up. So having that worked out and in there is just huge, is a huge benefit. And in addition, we've also been using a program called Air Data for those reports for FAA and it tracks everything from battery cycles, pilot input, flight times, directions, photos, you name it, it has all that data. I can compile a report in about five minutes on all my pilots and submit that whenever needed. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. So, um, in regard to what do I need to do initially to kind of get this program off and make sure that it, it's successful is the part 107 certificate, uh, COA operations manual, and then training in, in familiarization plan. So once we have this in place, we have our operations manual, we have our drones, we've got our, 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 our waivers, or we have our COA. 
we're ready to fly, but we're not always flying. So how are we staying prepared? And that's when you kind of build out that training and familiarization plan, which is part of your operational manual. Just like anything else that's being done, any other tool that's being leveraged, you either you can have some bi-weekly or monthly training. And importance with it, 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 it might be difficult, right, to get that bi-weekly training in because currently we're not just integrating drone pilots into public safety. We have folks that have a full-time uh, load on their plate and now they're taking on drones. So even monthly- Amen to that, Paul. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> so so even, even monthly training can, can become, I want to say challenging, but if you can plan it and you can have an idea, you can have goals that you're going to accomplish, the- the, the real importance of this is it's, it's technology and it changes quickly. So even if part of your training is checking firmware and updating software, you've got to put these batteries through some regular flight. So that monthly training is going to help you make sure that your equipment uh, is, is ready to go. And, and in some cases, this monthly might not be enough. But when you're getting things rolling, this has to be one of those things that is, is looked at and said, yes, training, we've got to get folks together regularly. And if you're going to build a program out, you're, you can't do it individually. You can't fly every mission. So that's why this is so important. And part of your training is new pilot familiarization. You've got to have that process as to how do we take pilots that have zero experience and, and bring them into the process. We can't always expect pilots to have recreational experience at some point it's taking folks who are already really good at what they do and again putting that tool in their hands to make them better so what's our what's our plan for new pilot familiarization and how do we get them in, involved in in this training uh, again training keeps both the pilots and your equipment prepared so uh we can kick to the next slide and then anyone tuning in, whether you have a program, you're considering launching a program, one of the more, most important things is know the rules and the regulations because to some degree, you may not be flying under them, but at, at this time, you are, again, to a degree, enforcing these rules and regulations. So knowing what a commercial operator can and cannot do knowing what a recreational operator can and cannot do, and then knowing what you're allowed to do if you see a drone operator and you, you think that they're not following uh, these rules and regulations, because that itself, we're gonna see drones become more, more heavily used, and we may see with, with different things like drone shield and these you know, remote ID, and if we can identify friend from foe more clearly, what measures are law enforcement, public safety going to have uh, in, in regards to policing them? So knowing the rules and the regulations is very important from an operator and from an enforcer standpoint. And if you're building that drone program within your organization, share this, share this basic knowledge with your colleagues and coworkers so that they understand what they can and can't do and then i think that's that's it in regards to my slides if anyone wanted to add um uh whether it's uh, michael or brandon or uh, uh mike chapman that was very well, good I, I was just going to jump in there a little bit and talk about uh training and workload like uh like you said one of the most difficult things that we had in the fdny was uh um, our pilots were having a, a dual role, uh, like many of all of us have. Um, in June, we, uh, we were able to start uh, a new, I call it Robotics uh, 2.0, where we regrouped and now we're a dedicated unit just for Robotics and UAS. And it, it has uh, amazing results because of all the things that you talked about, upgrading firmware, training every day, going out every day. And uh, I, I can, in just the, since June 1st, I can see the difference in the pilots and proficiency that our pilots have. So anybody who ha is in command staff and, and I know budgets, like we talk about budgets, budgets are tight, but uh, uh, having a, a dedicated unit is very important. And we had to attach some things to make the worth, uh, 
you know, to make the program more, more worthful. So we basically attach robotics as a whole. We're operating ground units, marine units, and uh, other technology. And simply, if we can't fly, we'll uh, stream from a ground camera. So these are all things to uh, take into consideration if you uh, are starting a program and trying to add worth to it. Thank you, Michael. All right, so we're going to move forward. In the interest of time, we want to give everybody the same amount. Or you know, it's very in-depth subjects that I was mentioning in the chat room. We're just giving you a brief overview of how drones can enhance your decision making on the fire ground. It's not a comprehensive presentation by any means, but one of the things that firefighters understand and first responders understand is the value of a 360-degree size up, and in many cases, that's limited or prevented by because of situations, context, environment, size of the building, size of the incident. With a drone, we can get a lot more information, whether it's visual, thermal, or lots of other things. Uh, search for lost persons, mass casualty incidents, patients spread over a large area. I work in an airport. We talk about plane crash, whether it's a steep angle or a slight angle. When they go in at a steep angle, we end up with debris scattered everywhere that could be very valuable in that. Uh, MVAs with multiple patients ejected at night. Uh, and then this, the bare bones tactics of strategies and tactics, fire attacks, search, ventilation, and more. And uh, Brother Michael Chapman will chime in when we get to the hazardous material incident, because I do not claim to be a hazardous magician. I've spent my career running away from the hazardous material side, stayed on the engine company side of things. But the drone and thermal fascinates me, so that's where I put, my, put all my focus. So let's talk about the new first responder. As you can see here in this picture that... Uh, Clear and Michael Chapman has provided. This is a side view of a fire incident from a 640 by 480 uh, X210 or a Matrice M210 with the XT camera, I believe, on it. And there are a lot of departments, especially law enforcement, employing something called a rapid response model. Chula Vista is one of those. Basically, they have drones staged on rooftops and can operate range from one to four miles. And this provides valuable data because if you're in the first responder world, police, fire, EMS, search and rescue, you know that we make decisions on incomplete, inaccurate, or estimated information. So more real-time data is uh, uh, the guy from FLIR Delta, I can't remember his name, escapes me right now. He says that the, the difference between a thermographer and a first responder using a drone is we need real-time information. We don't have time to go into a lab and analyze this for hours. We need to do it in seconds or minutes. So a drone first responder program provides decision quality data. And that's the stuff that we need, and especially in the world we live in now. I know uh, Michael was talking about, Leo was talking about, you know, very dense urban areas. Everybody's getting packed together. So one incident can have collateral damages on other incidents. So exposures and things of that nature, drones can help with that. So drone first responder program is not just a technical solution, but it's a tactical thing. And you want to read more. There's a quote right here from the Police One article from uh, Deploying a Drone as a First Responder Program in Chula Vista. thought that was a really good article. So we want to share resources as well as this. But let's talk more about the 360-degree survey. Go ahead. Did you say something, Mike? And if I may, I think it's a good time. I mean, I think public safety decision making with everybody needs to understand uh, with drones is not about the art of drone flight. It's about the science of collection uh, of incredible amounts of data uh, supported by a team of subject matter experts skilled in processing that data uh, so that you can rapidly understand each situational application of the drones uh, or that the drones are in to ensure the best decisions are made for protection of lives and property. And uh, I, think, uh, I think that boils down everything that you covered there uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the nature of information being collected needing to be processed for decision making. Absolutely. Well said. And that, and that when we're talking about, you know, the fire service specifically, you know, the fire service tends to get shortchanged when it comes to funding. I know all protective services get shortchanged, but we seem to be like the last kid on the dodgeball team when it comes to funding. So when you look at, you know, I'd say 1.1 million firefighters, 900,000 on a combination or volunteer, which means they operate with two stations or less. And I think it's pretty prohibitive when we come up with really expensive programs when departments that rely on fish fries, barbecues, and ice cream sales to put fuel in their trucks and pay their payments on the fire station. So when we come up with these out of box solutions that Paul will talk about at the end, it can provide them real time data in some of these rural areas that, that without this information, as Mike says, it could be very harmful to them. So to have this information to say, hey, this house is on fire 300 yards off the road, and we're gonna have to commit a tanker or a tanker shuttle. Uh, we've got a large scale incident with victims spread out. 
before they get there, getting that information to them. They can look from the top if they're a trained uh, operator and tell, hey, this, this building, based on what I'm seeing, is starting to have some structural integrity failure. I can see where the fire is going from hot to cold. I can watch the spread. Is there access issues to the property or to the building? Does it have a fence around it? Is there power lines, uh, infrastructure? Is there things that could harm me that I don't see? Is there a, a partial wall around propane tanks? You know, they, they're starting to enclose some of these utility infrastructures in dense urban areas, so they look pretty, but they're still dangerous. And, and it doesn't help us when we got, you know, five, 10,000 gallon propane tanks hidden behind a pretty masonry wall that we didn't see. Uh, and these solutions are not just UAVs. They're unmanned stationary things, such as the fire rover solution. This is an uh, example of a drone operation system where this has a FLIR A210 automation camera. So this camera actually does a lot of automatic calculations, looks for minimum and maximum temperatures. And then they look for things like in this tip fire, this is actually metal, scrap metal. And when certain temperatures go to a certain point, it, it notifies the operator. They zoom in on it, they focus in on that area, they get a minimum, maximum, average temperature. And once that guy gets out of the way, they deploy a fire suppression system, similar to what you'd see in airports and large scale uh, foam operations. And their motto is when you see smoke, our job is done. So this is not just flying drones. There's all kinds of things that are unmanned to start with, but they need a trained operator to go in. Uh, we can look at buildings from the fire aspect and say, okay, this is uh, Mike Chapman's video. And you see the difference between thermal and something called FSX, which is an industrial concept where they overlay the, the actual thermal and the digital. Why is that valuable to a first responder? Because in thermal, I can't see smoke technically. I can see the effects of it, but with FSX, I can see the direction of the smoke travel. So that's a big deal for us. And if you look, he's got it in an isotherm, so certain temperatures are highlighted. We can see where the fire is, where it's spreading. And if the crews inside tell me, hey, we've got a knock on this chief, we got the fire out, and you're watching the heat temperatures or the heat move across from one side to the other and they're getting worse, you can say, I don't think so. I think you need to get in there and check it. I can also see exposure problems which is really valuable because they're building houses so close you can barely fit a push mower between. So that's, that's the value of this data. It's real time. It's giving us more information. It's not just optical, it's optical and thermal and a lot more. So, you know, and these, these solutions are not that expensive when you look at the cost of equipment overall. Uh, this is actual optical. If you couldn't afford a thermal situation or a thermal package, you can look at the smoke, you can read smoke, you can look at where the actual fire location is. You can look at exposure hazards, as I mentioned. You can see things that you wouldn't be able to see if you couldn't do a 360 for various reasons. There's lots of other things. We'll make sure we mute our microphones, everyone. So you can see in this one, this is, if you're a smoke reader, I got heavy volume, velocity, density, and color, and I got fire erupting from the back. So with thermal, I can see through the smoke and see the heat and see the heat through that structure. So that can tell me an approximate location of the fire, the severity of the fire, lots of things that I couldn't see without a drone in the air. They even have tethered solutions that when you pull a drawer on a fire truck, the drone pops up, sits there, and is completely powered, doesn't have to come down, and provides that information to the incident commander. It's a great video from Paul Rossi on uh, wildland fire applications, and I told him he, he uh, changed my mind about uh, low-resolution thermal cameras. I'm not a big fan of that but this has a high resolution digital camera with a lower resolution thermal camera overlay. And I'm not so concerned specifically with the individual measurements of the thermal as I am the overall looking at the heat and where it's going, especially a wildland fire application. We can see the heat, we can see the approximate travel of where it's going combined with weather information, where my crews are operating, Maybe I need to move my crews. This is valuable data. And look at the high quality image from the digital perspective. And uh, Paul, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a lower cost uh, thermal and digital uh, drone package right here. Uh, this is something, yeah. right? Is that's that correct? The Mav yeah, that's the Mavic 2 Enterprise Duel. And like you said, with that MSX uh, overlay, you can actually see down there the, uh, the firefighter putting out uh, you can see the stream of the hose mm -hmm. so it's not necessarily the tool for maybe search and rescue which we're going to dive into further it is a low-cost solution you know four thousand dollars where you're getting this advanced data so certainly 
Good job. And a great video. Thanks for providing it. Uh, another great shot, Paul, if you want to chime in, is this is the control view of of a wildland fire of what the controller is seeing. And I like the fact that it's saying that passenger aircraft is approaching, descend as soon as possible. Uh, they, they, they have so many things incorporated in this. And as you mentioned in the beginning, that's where proper training comes in. If they don't, you know, when we teach thermal imaging, we teach them to read the screen and interpret the data. If they don't know how to interpret this data. They're just flying a remote controlled airplane. And we need to have proper, well-trained operators. Uh, yeah, and I would say with this screen right here, you can see it, these newer advanced drones have the ability to, to show you with the different ADSB and what they have built in to say, hey, there's a passenger aircraft nearby. There was actually a manned aircraft that was in support of this operation as well. So it, it was correct that there was that aircraft nearby. Yeah, and that's, and that's valuable data because I can't see that, right? Unless I have flight radar and lots of other things, they're not going to monitor that. So more information, more real-time data without overwhelming the operator and giving them that information in a way they can understand it is very, very valuable. And in our world, we have seconds to make a decision that can last a lifetime. So Andy, we, that's, a, yes, Andy that's a great, great call out that, uh, you know, the smaller drones uh, are great for certain applications, whereas the larger drones are great for other applications. And, uh, and what you just showed in that last clip um, uh, on the slide prior, you don't need to go back, but, uh, Okay. The amount of heat that's showing up there makes that drone particularly suitable. Whereas if you're searching for a person, you don't have the same flexibility. You don't have the same capabilities with that smaller drone and lower resolution camera. But if you're looking at a fire, you've got a large heat mass uh, of your target, make it very smaller, a lower resolution drone. And while you're on, while you're on, Mike, uh, let's talk about this wildland fire application video you hear or you have posted for us about. This is a great video where it's actually tracking and showing some things that you, I'd like for you to chime in on what you, what you filmed for us here. Yeah, so what you're looking at right here, basically is just, you're looking at fire spread in a wildland uh, fire uh, application. You're looking at your fire lines. You're looking at your safe zones or unburned fuel uh, that might be available. Uh, you're looking at your, your backfires and seeing uh, what your effectiveness is of your backfires or your fire lines. Uh, maybe where water supplies might be. You could use your drone to, uh, to fly out of your perimeter to see where your potential water supplies would be, either for trucks or for uh, uh, aerial uh, helicopter applications. Mm -hmm. So there's many, many opportunities here. And I think the key takeaway here is, as you pointed out in the earlier uh, uh, slide, it's not always thermal. Uh, it's visual and thermal or a combination of the two. Knowing when and where to apply those and how to assimilate that data uh, for your decision is really key here. Yeah, and no I like that. Bullet. And I like how you, you panned out at the end because something we teach about the importance of field of view. You went from focusing on the immediate problem and went back and looked at the problem as a whole. And that kind of gives the incident commander an idea of where they're at. Uh, and it helps them identify that fire line too, which is great. Um, That's right. And this is from FLIR Delta. You can get these off of YouTube and, and watch these for free. It's a great example of why what Mike just said is important that we have to understand that it's not just high resolution, it's all about the context of the environment and the situation. These are two high resolution cameras, thermal cameras looking at some people and some cars at 1800 feet and approximately 1900 feet in one and 1000 feet and 1700 feet in the other, and showing the difference in visibility when I'm searching for someone. And as Mike Chapman said, if I'm searching for people, I need to focus on the right resolution, with the right lens, you know, field of view, because that makes a big difference. If I have a wide field of view, I may be able to see the actual incident very well, but I may not be able to see a small target, such as a small child lost in the woods. So it's important that you get the right camera, right drone for the right context. Don't just buy one and think, well, this is going to work for everything. I, I have that trouble teaching firefighters that a low cost thermal imaging camera is not for everything either. They're, they're designed for specific context. And those of us who work in uh, the limited staffing environment can appreciate the fact when you've got four people fighting a fire, you need to know when things are gonna go bad or, or if they had to ventilate a structure, where would be the proper place to ventilate? This is an optical and thermal. This is a Chapman's video he did for us when our last burn for Project Kill the Flashover we did where the students were doing their research project. We can overlay in this case, we have the optical and thermal together, but you can look at either or. And as Mike shows in some of his videos, you can actually turn the, the MSX off or on. And in this video, you can see the ridgeline vents, the chimney, 
the differences in where it's a shingle roof versus a tin roof. You can see where the vent, it's venting heat on the left side, where it's moving from right to left, hot to cold. You can see the fire before you see flame, if that makes sense, because we see infrared energy. We see the hose line placement. We see where the firefighters are. We can actually tell, and, and I know this sounds silly, but we can tell if the fire truck's parked too close to the structure. I don't know about you, but if you ever burnt the paint off a truck, you find yourself writing a letter, Dear Chief, I find myself explaining the unexplainable. No one was more surprised when I, yeah, you don't want to do that. Uh, situational awareness is probably the biggest key that we talk about in decision making is seeing the things, as Dr. Gassaway says, that can hurt us before they actually do. Uh, this video is from the Fire Drones Facebook page. It's from the recent incident in Jacksonville Fire Department where they had a car barge on fire. Now think about this, if you will, that this, this drone operator who was helping them was able to show a spot temperature measurement on the side of the boat, on the exterior, it was over 500 degrees. In thermography, they teach us, if I see that on the outside of the structure, depending on the insulation and the thickness of the material, it's at least double that on the inside. So what kind of conditions are these firefighters facing? Is that worthy of an interior attack based on that and what you're seeing? What's the overall level of severity? There was heat signatures running three-fourths of this boat. What kind of exposures are being threatened? Do I have a possible explosion? Do I need to use this information to help me define a hot, warm, and cold zone? Or do I need the information to help me with, you know, shelter in place? And uh, Brother Chapman, if you want to come on, we're going to talk about hazmat a little bit. And I'm going to let you kind of key in because Mike, if you don't know, Mike Chapman is from FLIR, but Mike also has over 20 years in the fire service. He's also uh, well depth in uh, hazardous materials. He was an optical gas imaging guy, worked in the industry and understands some things that most of us haven't got to play with. So Mike, you want to talk about uh, initial assessment and how this can help you with hot and warm cold zones, even without an optical gas imaging camera, how this could help us? Yes, so uh, historically uh, in the hazardous materials environment, uh, speed has, uh, <laughs> has not always been uh, uh, the, the, the primary concern, uh, typically hazardous materials responses tend to be kind of slow because everything's methodically thought out. Uh, all the data is uh, interpreted, uh, gathered, interpreted, filtered, and then, uh, and then we try to make decisions on that. And so uh, what the drones allow us to do is perform that initial assessment a lot quicker than we used to be able to do it because we can put people, um, we can put drones down range, whereas before we had to put the people down range to do that uh, initial recon. Uh, or the initial reconnaissance or initial site assessment. Now we can throw a drone in the air. Uh, we can uh, you know, keep it out of harm's way. And from a distance, gather the information, help us design uh, or define what the hot, warm and cold zones are. Absolutely. Yeah, well said, sure. but, but looking at, uh, mm -hmm. at, at tank levels, we can look at uh, liquid levels in tanks. We could look at uh, degrees of spills, you know, how far the, uh, the, the fuel or the, uh, the chemical uh, has spread. Uh, the direction of travel, and then uh, even for gas leaks, there's opportunities with, uh, as you mentioned, optical gas imaging cameras and payloads uh, for drones where we can see the physical gas, uh, the, the visual gas um, uh, leaking that uh, would not be able to be seen by your naked eye. So you're, you're using a thermal camera to see that, uh, whereas here it's just completely an optical view uh, of a large fire. Uh, obviously, that's going to give us a good uh, uh, understanding that uh, there's a major problem with potential for uh, uh, mass impact on a, on a community. Uh, we can very rapidly, over a large scale area, get a good situational awareness or a handle of, of what's going on without sending people down range. The um, uh, risks of overheated tanks, uh, being able to put water on those uh, overheated tanks to potentially prevent blevy or a boiling liquid, uh, boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. Um, you know, those are all the things that, uh, that are in consideration. And uh, the primary goal is, uh, is safety. And it's not only safety for the responders, but it's safety for the public, of course, that we're trying to protect. And so uh, it all goes into one. And so the drones certainly give us extra tools in the toolbox to make that happen. And I, I like the fact this image, uh, in, in all truth, doctored up a little bit in the smoke. But we want to show you the power of what you can see of how this is going to affect the community around it when he was talking about urban areas. Um, and size up, and we as a first responder, no matter where we're at, police, fire, EMS, size up is one of the most critical parts of our job, and it's a continuous thing. So this video provided to us by Brian King from FLIR, uh, we synced these two together. They happen to be doing some training next to a place where they actually had a hazmat incident. And you can actually see the aerial cooling the tank. They can confirm they're making 
contact with the tank. They're able to take measurements and see if they're keeping the tank under a certain temperature. Uh, this actually was one of the tanks over the left side, like a, a vertical tank collapsed, which you can see here in a minute. You can see the optical versus the thermal. They show you some different varying color palettes and how that works and helps. You can actually see the, the thermal pattern. You can see the leak and the, the runoff from this from an environmental perspective. Where is that going? How is that affecting me? Is it exposing these, whatever these cylinders are above it? Is, is that something I need to be concerned with? Do I need to withdraw my troops, move them to another area? focus my suppression area efforts in another area? Do I need to expand my hot zone, shrink it? All of that can be real-time data feed fed back to the incident commander, just like this is, I'm not a big fan of multicolor palettes, but in this case, when you look at the rainbow color palette, it's usually designed for a low temperature, low contrast environment. Look at the difference in detail you can get in the situation versus when we went from gray and white, black and white to an iron bow color palette. You know, that's one of the most popular ones because people like it. I'm more of a functional guy, not an aesthetics guy. I want to see what I need to see. But this is valuable data that is real time. And these, as Mike said a minute ago, it allows us to do a risk assessment without putting people in there. And it's non-contact measurement. That's the whole purpose of thermography. And we can do a lot of things. He's already mentioned thermal data, optical gas imaging, and they're equipping them with meters even. To you know, go around and see what what's the LEL around here. What's the what? What am I exposing the community to? And that's all coming. And some of it's current, and that's valuable stuff. And as you know, as the technology increases, the price will come down. A thermal imaging camera used to be thirty thousand dollars. You can go to Dick's Sporting Goods and buy one for two hundred bucks. Does that mean that's the one you need? No, not necessarily. But look at the power of thermal data and optical being able to use this. And Antonio, with your company with Fox Fury if this was at night, the lighting couldn't be overstated. So uh, when we talk about hazmat incidents or large scale incidents, a drone is key. Look at the amount of you know damage we're causing the community with the exposure problems. Uh, Brian King gave us this data from a, a hazmat incident. I want you to look at, uh, Mike, if you wanna chime in, Chapman, about the Sky Ranger and this aspect of what we're watching here. This is the thermal video of that incident you see a minute ago with the actual map and some command information going back. You there, Mike Chapman? Yes. So, uh, so basically, uh, when we made the comment a while ago, different drones for different applications. The uh, uh, the the Mavic, um, you know, two uh, E dual uh, with the thermal is not going to give you the same amount of data as this drone here. It's a completely different class of drone. This is an Ariane, a uh, formerly Ariane, a FLIR uh, Sky Ranger R70 that's uh, capturing this data. And so what you're seeing there is a couple of silos in the background, uh, one of which has fallen. Uh, I believe there's actually two that might've fallen there that initially uh, kicked off. Uh, there was a lot of pallets on the ground. Uh, and, uh, and you're able to see not only that there's fire continuing to burn and, uh, and a significant heat uh, source with those uh, silos that are on the ground, but also the degree of fire spread and then the impact on that propane tank, as you saw uh, that water was being applied to uh, in the earlier video. And so uh, you just have to be able to, uh, to realize that there are different tools in the toolbox. There's many different drones with many different types of applications. You know, all of this is part of the, uh, you know, the Sky Ranger uh, package. There's really no outside influence, uh, outside, uh, you know, software or data uh, going into it. But, uh, but you see there, there's value in the visual video uh, and then there's a value in the thermal video. So independently, they offer their own you know, key attributes for uh, situational awareness. And uh, the combination of the two is just uh, invaluable with, with regard to decision-making uh, intelligence. So, uh, and, and, I do want, and I do uh, want to just add that with these incidents here, it's not that the drone is, is done because we see the fire, like large two slides back, the size of the fire, we know where it is, we've located it, but now we're using this drone to suppress it, prevent it from going into other locations, um, which you couldn't do with any any other ground, you know, equipment. You wouldn't get that same picture. 